Again, now I've driven this issue of life cycle a heck of a lot. Life cycle is a system. If my management decision early on is to select a particular machine because it's what I had in the other company and that machine isn't suitable for this new process, then the choice at that point in time destroys the profitability of the company in future. And if you can't, can't see the 20 or 30 or 50 year thinking you have to have to get to high reliability in an operation plant, then you need to go back and understand how that works. So we're going to talk about life cycle risk reduction. Risk across the life cycle so that if I, if I reduce risk, I create reliability. We saw that equation previously. Now, there are eight questions that Planet Equipment Wellness is trying to develop answers for. There are economic factors. Uh, is the consequence of failure a problem? If it is acceptable to fail, nobody's going to change their mind. If it isn't acceptable to fail, then I have to solve that particular problem. If failure is acceptable, then how many failures can I have? Now, this machine that goes down, can I afford the machine to go down once a month? or once a year, or once every 10 years. Because once a month is different to maintain to once a year, to once every 10 years. Once every 10 years, different way to look at the world, totally different way. But I've got to know that at the beginning. Again, we're down now to the physics of failure. If we're going to work at the parts level, then what parts uh, are overstressed and how will that destroy the, the, the microstructure? How can it be fatigued? How can it be degraded? What are the activities that we are doing to this machine that we are destroying it in doing those activities? Because I've got to stop those. Or if I can't stop them, I've got to minimise their impact very, very low. And if they're always going to be there, then that affects what spares I carry. It affects whether I have a standby pump. It affects the skills I need in my guys to repair things quickly in, in the right way. So this issue of a physics of failure is vital in deciding what we're going to do and how we're going to tackle those things. Of course, we have human beings, the hardest part of, of the equation to address. Can human error lead to a failure? Does it matter if it does? If it doesn't, leave it alone. If it does matter, if human error cannot be allowed, if our process diagram says, gee, if that bearing's installed incorrectly, uh, or with the wrong grease, or installed back the front, um, now these things become important. Now I've got to control those things. So the questions are to bring to the surface what really is important to put in this process we're designing and building to guarantee reliability. So yeah, the eight questions become drivers of finding the right answers. This particular diagram is just those eight questions put into some sort of process flow, some sort of picture, I guess, a mental picture or, or a visible picture by equipment number, we look at the criticality of the equipment, the risk of the equipment. If it doesn't matter, run to fail. That's, that's all okay because financially it's a smart thing to do. If it does matter and we can't have this thing break, then what are the part numbers that are going to pull this thing down when they break? So find those part numbers, have a look at physics of failure, have a look at organisation, organisational factors, then build the processes that satisfy those answers. And uh, we keep going around that loop again and again and again. But we're focusing on the thing that makes the difference. Don't let the parts fail. No parts failure, no machine failure, no production stoppage, no output disruptions. Happy customers. I guess uh, as one of the issues with a life cycle mentality is this early phase, this, this phase when the design choices are made, the design decisions are made. When you look at the standard design process of building a process plant, of building uh, equipment itself, of installing oil and gas refineries, for example, there, there'll be a concept, a business reason to do this thing. Somebody will specify a preliminary design. You know? Oh, this plant in, in, in Germany, we did it this way. Oh, we'll just copy that here in the USA and that should be okay. Uh, there'll be some costing done to justify the financial reasons for it. There'll be an approval if the financing makes sense and there's return on investment. Then, of course, we do the full design, right down to nitty gritty, uh, so we can actually build this thing. There'll be blueprints, there'll be specifications, there'll be documentation, procedures, contracts, uh, all that sort of stuff will come out of that design process. There'll be a review, typically a HAZOP or, or the equivalent, to assess if this design is, is actually 
usable and safe enough to use. Finally, the design's approved and we construct. That's the typical process engineering houses are asked to do. And where is the analysis of operating and business risk? The silly people here have not asked, is this thing going to make good money for us? The assumption is it will. You know, back here somebody says, oh, we've approved it, but it all depends that everything goes right, that the availability is at the level we intend it to be. It doesn't say what are the risks to prevent this from happening. The assumption here is everything is good. Never. If it goes bad, what does it mean? Will it go bad? Well, in my career, every company I've worked for, lots of things go bad. The design we want to see happen never fulfills itself 100% of the time. 85% of the time, 90% of the time, the other 10% of the time, it goes, it goes bad. And that 10% destroys 90% of the profit. So if I'm designing and do not think about the business's future and its operating costs as a design requirement, then I just build a happy world on paper that can never be replicated in the real world. So I've got to have my project and design guys understand what their selection will mean to the company. You chose that machine, you chose that material, you chose that supplier, you chose that manufacturer. That choice has 20, 30, 40 year impacts. We need to project 20, 30, 40 years ahead. Please, Mr. Uh, engineer, is that machine going to be a problem for us in 10 years' time or in 20 years' time? So we want them at the design phase to understand the risks and the costs that decision will cause us if it goes bad. If the world's rosy and everything's good and never goes bad, wonderful, I'd like that too. But that isn't the real world. I've got to think about what if it goes bad? Because when it goes bad, we here in operations, we're the headless chooks. We're running around never solving the problem, living with it all the time. We know that because from the data collected over many years, if I want low operating costs, I have to have that decision made here. 95% of my costs in operations are fixed at the handover stage. When I hand over from, product, from process um, design and engineering to operations, operating costs are already set in place and I can do nothing more here except to try and make sure the machines are running as best they can. If I want to have low maintenance costs, low operating costs, I'll make that choice here. I can't deliver it when it's too late. So yes, we want a process that helps our project guys and our selections and our managers and our CEOs back here to understand that their choices have huge long-term impacts. So I need a way of getting people to understand what it means by making that choice now and the success or the failure it brings in the future. So this is the doctor, design and operating costs, total optimised risk done by the project guys, by the finance guys, not done by the guys in operations. It's too late by then. So the whole point being is you know, we're going to play what if games. This we've seen before. I just want to reinforce why we do this. Well, this particular model of while things are still on the drawing board, doing you know, if that bearing fails on that pump, what does that mean? If that pump fails for half a day, what does that mean? If I'm out of production because I've lost power on the transformer, I'm the only transformer coming into the operation, what does that mean? While it's still a piece of paper. Yeah. Well, things are still a piece of paper. Let's ask the hard questions, the 20 year and 30 year questions. Ask them now, because this is real cheap to fix. But once those things are in place, it's 100 times the cost to correct that afterwards. So, a PEW, requires this to be done by the engineering and finance guys because they're part of the problem and of course they're part of the solution as well. This is a, a summary of the things I've covered before. The risk is the driver or minimising the risk is the driver. I've got to show people what risk they've got. Now, when I buy a pump chosen by an engineer 20 years ago, it doesn't mean the pump's going to be a bad pump in operation, but the risk is there. You know, if something bad is done, then a bad outcome is a disaster for the business. So I want to help the guys see that the operating risk is something they control at the design phase. So I've got to talk about risk in dollars and likelihood and cost. 
as things are still being put together at the blueprint stage. We saw this one before, um, and it's the same story. If we can reduce the risk, we're going to free up dollars because low risk of failure means high reliability. And high reliability means not spending money on maintenance and, and downtime and, and production losses. So um, we're going to do consequential reduction. There are things we're going to not, we're going to try and minimise the loss if something does go bad. But the best strategy is not to have things go bad in the first place. So PW focuses very hard on preventative and uh, um, elimination of risk as much as possible. Whole point being is that's where the money is. That's where the money is.